This is the illest rest stop of all time. This is incredible. Look at this selection. Yeah. This is a rest stop. Like, this should be a Sabaro or a Miami Subs. They have Burgundian wines. 2013 Chablis. Domaine Girard Tremblay. This is crazy. Dude, look at the garlic and the green beans, man. Yeah. Capricola thin sliced. I mean, what rest stop have you ever seen it like this? So much good stuff here. You could go to a restaurant in America, they won't even have ham that good. No, no, no. You win. You win. If I was a truck driver or I was remaking over the top, I would do it in Burgundy. <laughs> I'm ready. So, so viewers, you guys know usually I'm a Boone's Farm strawberry daiquiri, blue margarita man. Yeah. But I used to bring shorties to Michael's restaurant, Bar Baloo. He would select the finest bottles, the finest vintages, help me turn up for these dates. And one time... And clothes. And yes. And you clothes. Close. Always. And one time he poured out 1979 Cristal, great viscosity, mm -hmm. tasted like creme brulee, Notes of almond, notes of hazelnut, just all in there. And it, it got me hooked. And through the last three to four years, I've really gotten into wine thanks to this man. Mm -hmm. And Eddie, right now, we are in the center of the universe for wine. We're in Burgundy. This is first and first half, motherfucker. This is where it all happens. This is two grapes, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. So this is the Burgundy wine region. To the south, you have Merceau, and then moving north, you go to Volnay, Pomard, Bone, and end up in Gevry Chambertin at the top of the Cote de Nuit. When we go further north, you're hitting Chablis. We're at my friend's domain in the village of Bone. He wants us to taste through his barrels and see what's going on. Let's taste this mother barrels. This is crazy. So this is Mark Eddy. This is his domain. Nice. What's the name of the domain? Domain Clos de la Chapelle. Okay. You didn't want to go with Domain Mark? <laughs> you know, it's not exactly French. So I wouldn't endear myself to my colleagues. What got you into wine? Well, I started drinking Burgundy when I was 21. Mm -hmm. uh, fell in love with it. and I been, was still drinking Fetzer. <laughs> yeah, I've been collecting it ever since. I walked in here, and you can, like, smell the barrels. Yeah. You can smell everything going on. You can't put your finger on it. But it smells like a cellar, and the, the aroma is very powerful as yeah. soon as you walk in the door here. Burgundy has had vines grown in this area since the Roman times. When we say any particular vineyard is, is among the best, it's, it's literally over centuries of time that it's had that kind of pedigree. The old world wines are all about place. Yeah. So when you talk about what you like about Burgundy, you taste the soil or the minerality or the limestone or whatever, you're tasting from a particular place. One very important concept in Burgundy is terroir. Terroir is a combination of elements in the land like soil and climate that give wine its flavor. There's 400 types of soil in the region, so the wine here is categorized in three groups. The most common is village wine sits at the base of the slope. Premier Cru is well placed on the hill and makes up most of the high-end varietals. And then there's Grand Cru, a perfectly placed sliver of hillside that makes the best wine in the region. We're gonna try the Corton Charlemagne here. One of the differences between the whites and the reds is that the white wines are fermented in the barrel. I've never had it out of the barrel before. I love wine because there's something mystical and mysterious about it that you can't grasp and you can't hold. And it really mirrors all the things that are really interesting and that can actually teach you in life is that you'll never fully understand it. That is excellent. It has the steeliness, almost like a Chablis. It's a little more floral, but that the minerality is strong here. Yeah. 
how much does a bottle of your wine go for? Well, it depends. The lower end of uh, the range, it's going to be about $55 or $60 a bottle. Yeah. And at the top end of the range for Corton Charlemagne at retail, it could be $250 a bottle. This is $250. Yes. It tastes like $250. Well, thank you. <laughs> Most things in life I've learned from rap music, but the, the wines that they've led me to are quite terrible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that is so sexy. Dude is penetrating a barrel of sexy wine with the glass pipe. <laughs> Basics of winemaking involve harvesting, crushing, and fermentation. But a lesser known part of the process is what's called clarification and aging, where some wines are kept in the barrel and infused with additional flavors before bottling. So we're going to head to Tonalary Caduce to learn more about the relationship between barrel making and wine. you sell the barrels for each one? 600 euros to 1,000. It wow. depends on the, the origin of the oak, tightness of the grain, and the size of the barrel. This is a yard where we store and we season all the oak. And then the flavor of the barrels goes into the wine. Exactly. Yeah. This is like letting wine breathe. You like letting the wood breathe. I'm curious, you know, a lot of good winemakers I know They'll buy old barrels from people and then make wine that year with somebody else's old barrels. Why would they do that? The goal can be different depending on what you want to do. You want to bring some toasty notes or some structure to the wine, and some, uh, some flavors. See, to us, we, we would never know this. We wouldn't know to look at the looseness or the tightness or the thickness, or we wouldn't know to season the wood. Like, coming to see this, you take a barrel for granted. You look at a barrel, you say, oh, it's just a, something that's like wooden Tupperware. You put the wine in here. But there's a lot of craft mm -hmm. to this. Yeah, a lot of craft. Definitely. So what's burning in here is all oak waste. Oak waste. Yeah. So we control the duration, so that it's very consistent. Here is going to check the temperature, and we need to uh, to reach 200 degrees to get it very clean. Nice. Yeah. I love looking at this because when you look at winemaking and barrel making, it looks medieval. It is medieval practice, right? Kind but of. you have it down to a science and it's yeah. so precise. It's a combination of tradition and a bit of technology with some machines. It can only change so much, just like the terroir or just yeah. like Burgundy wine. Exactly, yeah. oh, oh, is that too hard? Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> Besides just getting the barrels right, the next challenge for the grower is when to bottle the wine after aging. So to show us this process, Mike's taking us to a tasting at the Hospice de Vaux, a former hospital for the poor that's now a museum. The Hospice holds a charity barrel auction each year during the Three Days of Glory Festival, and potential buyers come to taste the young wines to see which barrels are worth investing in. <laughs> So you, you literally have 33 different wines that the Ospice makes, and we have the opportunity to taste every single one if we want. The idea of it is to get a read on the vintage, to see what the vintage is like. So this is where you find that. So this, these are the premier crews. If you don't like these, you don't like Volnay. Okay. All right? That was terrible. <laughs> right? It is effervescent. So you gotta remember, it's not finished. You need another two years till it's finished. So this one, this one is still fermented. So yeah. Straight up. Yeah. But you know that's the thing. Like you can't really tell. No, but you can't just say this is shit and this is good. Yeah. Because this is not done. Yeah, not done. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. See, this is smoother, yeah. right? Yeah, and the oak shows less. Yeah, the, much the less. Sales. It's very smooth. It's silky on the nose. Yeah. 
It's very ripe. It's almost like raspberry. Yeah, both of them are ripe. No, why is it I keep getting it on my chin? Can't laugh when you see this. Look at my table. I'm not a good spitter. I'm usually a swallower. Like what, Michael? How many, Michael? Get over. We tasted what, like 16 wines? Yeah, about 20. 20 wines? I mean, let's count. Let's count it up. Yeah. 15 wines. Feeling it. All really feeling it. 2014, two months old. Two months old. Lots of acid, lots of tannins. Lots of alcohol. Yeah, lots of alcohol. The, uh, the Volnais were terrible. I wasn't a big fan of the Volnais. But we really liked Pomar Nepano, was my favorite. Yeah. Good vintage, tropical fruit, ample alcohol, good acidity, real great mouthfeel, kind of stony, rich, and powerful. That was fun. Hospices de Bon. Burgundy! As Burgundy's popularity has grown, there's been an increasing amount of foreign investment flowing into the region buying not only barrels at the hospice, but also vineyards from local growers. 35,000 euros in the room. So, we're in Merceau, and we're going to meet a realtor named Ben Haas, who's going to teach us about the economics of terroir. Bonjour. Hi, Eddie. Hi, welcome to Merceau. Nice Merceau. to meet you. Same Thank here. Thank you. Heard a lot about you. Oh, yes, good things. Well, yeah, very yeah. good thing. I've been looking on the internet and see you're doing some nice Yeah, uh, I see you saw my jacket and got a yeah. similar one. Matching colors. I appreciate this. Well, welcome to Burgundy for you. We're Thank an estate you. agency. And okay. I understand you want to understand something about the property in the vineyard. Yes. Do you think this land would be good for growing marijuana? <laughs> in the cellar, maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dutch. In, in uh, Holland, you can have yeah. a bad five plant, but in yeah. France, no way. Is real estate pretty hot in this area? Yes, specifically, I call it the Golden Mile. You know, between Bone and Chagny, we've got a large valley of vineyards, and people want to live in this area. When you look at the landscape, you understand why people want to live here. It looks like an impressionist painting. See, it's much nicer living in Europe. You drive two hours, you end up somewhere nice like Geneva. You live in New York, you drive two hours, you end up somewhere terrible like New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen any cops. <laughs> Maybe we should bring some good crime to this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And then start selling insurance and some alarm systems. Yeah. We need to create enterprise out here. There you go. Come Thank on. you. Eddie, come have oh. a look. Yeah, as I said, it's a clo. A clo means it's, it's all surrounded by clothes. It's all yeah. surrounded by walls. Well, let me show you. These are the vineyards. We're, we're in this place here. We're looking at this close to quarter. Each plot of land is so unique in its taste and flavor. That's why each village is quite unique as well. I tasted at the Hospices de Bon. Yeah. The best vineyard this year was Batard Montrachet. Yeah, now look at the price there. 9 to 10 million euros. 10 million. 10 million euros. Wow. For one hectare. One hectare. 10 million one. euros. Nope. A hectare is two and a half acres. Acres. Just recently, that guy bought a tenth of an acre for $1.2 million. Wow. Just one. And that's why I was telling you it real estate ex is quite expensive. You bring your Californian... What kind of furniture do you have in California? I got, you know, I, I have a very funny mixture of lucite furniture and uh, old opium den furniture. So <laughs> it'll be a very new look for Burgundy and Merceau. Right. I've that's built cool. my own Malibu scissor den. I live in Malibu. It's nice. Okay, well, nice. Yeah. You have to invite me sometime. Definitely. Kind of you drink scissor? I don't know what that is, but it's I would good. like you to come like and visit it. you. It's okay. kind of like Southern American okay. wine. While we're here, we gotta see Cote d'Ivoire, the most prized region in Burgundy, known for its peppery Grand Cru's and, of course, the inimitable Domaine Romani Cote, the most expensive wine in the world. We're gonna go to the ground level to meet Jean-Michel Guillaume, 
a local winemaker who runs a small vineyard with his son, Alexi, growing village wine in Cote de Nuit. There's been more and more interest in Burgundy over the last few decades. What do you think it is that's driven people towards Burgundy and, and put Burgundy on the map as good, if not better, than, say, Bordeaux? Comme vous venez ici au domaine, c'est le viticulteur qui fait le travail, qui fait la vigne, qui fait le vin, qui vous reçoit. C'est pas un, un maître tché, un, un président de, de trust, c'est un petit vigneron. Et c'est la réflexion de la, de, du bourguignon. Ici, on garde l'âme du vin. Nous sommes que deux, Alexis, my son et moi. This is Alexi? Oui, à Itaï pour le, la récolte 2015. Did you have a choice to be a winemaker? You wanted to be, or your dad said you're a winemaker? No, it's my father. <laughs> you enjoy it though? Yes. La vision future, euh, voilà, c'est qu'il perdure euh, et qu'il laisse le domaine intègre et qu'il lui transmette après à ses enfants de la même façon. Do you feel any pressure following in your father's footsteps and representing your family and representing Burgundy? Yes. What wine is this? Gevray Chambertin, 2012. This is red burgundy. You have the rotten leaves. You have the leatheriness. The morels, that funky mushroom. For a village wine, you can tell this is exceptional. The reality is there are a lot of investors from other places coming into Burgundy. Are you worried at all that other vineyards are selling to non-Burgundians? For me, there's no problem. Tant que ce ne soit pas généralisé, tant que ça reste des petits domaines qui se font racheter, ça fait partie des échanges normaux, au même titre que les Français vont acheter des domaines au Chili, aux États-Unis. Euh, donc c'est normal que aussi les autres pays s'intéressent à notre patrimoine. Il faut rester straight ahead, <rire> tout droit, ne pas écouter ce qui se passe autour. Faire uniquement travailler le, ses vignes et pas s'occuper de, des propositions alléchantes de, des investisseurs éventuels et continuer de travailler et de transmettre son patrimoine. Tous les vignerons, 99% des vignerons, s'ils ont de la famille dans le vignoble, veulent transmettre aux enfants, aux petits-enfants, aux neveux. C'est transmettre la passion, c'est transmettre le nom c'est transmettre aussi les recettes de vinification. Mais ça, c'est dans, dans la tradition bourguignonne. It's almost as if the Burgundian tradition is bigger than the individual. The individual is just a vehicle for this tradition to pass through. Oui. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Human Panda and you in Burgundy, mother. Incredible. It's just that magic. Oh, that's bothering me. <laughs> Louis Jadot is one of the largest landholders in Burgundy. You may know them from your favorite bodega, grocery store, or trap house for their value Beaujolais. I've drank the Beaujolais out of plastic cups, styrofoam cups, Dixie cups, with Chinese food, without Chinese food. But today, we're going to learn about their estate wines. Louis Jadot is a family winery started over 150 years ago, and they actually hold some of the best Grand Cru's in Burgundy. And I'm told if you push past the Beaujolais, there's a lot of good juice in them, Dar Hills. So we're meeting the deputy CEO and head winemaker to talk to them about the relationship between winemaker and terroir. This is your breakfast wine? Uh, he usually I take white for breakfast. Okay. <laughs> what is it that you love about Burgundian wine? Like, what is it that defines it for you? 
Actually, you know, I, I mean, I was born in Burgundy. I grew up in Burgundy. My family is from Burgundy and has been in the wine business since a very long time. So, of course, good to, to follow what your family, uh, what yeah. your father, grandfather has done. What is it that you want to do at Jadot? How do you think the wine is changing or not changing since you've been here? My uh, challenge is not to change <laughs> the wines. Uh, my feeling is the, the wines in Burgundy are really stronger as the people who are making it. The, the different places where we grow, our grape variety, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, are really strong and they don't need a magic guy uh, yeah. to make something because this is a really strong place and the quality of our wines in Burgundy are really the most important thing, not people who are behind. I feel this way about food as well because I cook very home style, very authentic, traditional Chinese or Taiwanese food at home. And even in my restaurant, I keep it pretty clear to my mom's recipes. Over time, you take out all the tricks, you take out all the secret ingredients and you strip it down to what it is. I keep it very simple. In Burgundy, you know, it's what you said, we are going back to something more simple. Of course, the soil is important, the place is important, but the quality of the vine plant is something very important. Yeah. You know, the monks, like 1,000 years ago, um, they were the first one to really understand, understand that, okay, the, the vines will produce better wine on the slope compared to the valley. From one place to another, even if it's a few meters away, there will be a huge difference because of the terroir, because of the, you know, the topography, the, or the orientation with the sun. And that's why if you look at the Burgundy label, the first thing you see is actually the name of the place. I mean, it's not the grape variety, it's not the name of the winemaker. We have to be very humble because, um, because Burgundy has such a big history and we are just a part of this history, a very small part. I really enjoy hearing you talk about wine it, because it's almost zen-like. You don't fight it. Acceptation. Water. Yeah. It's something very important uh, because winemaker, we accept a lot. We accept, <laughs> the, we accept the weather conditions, we accept the, the, the farming season. Sometimes it's easy, uh, sometimes it's really challenging. That's something you cannot, in fact, control. I accept the quality of this interview. It's incredible. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thibault wants to show us more of the community here in Burgundy. So we're heading to a lunch hosted by his father, Pierre Henry, the CEO. I came to Burgundy knowing that I was going to find better wine than American wine, but I had no idea I was going to find better cheddar biscuits. These are the greatest red lobster cheddar biscuits I have ever tasted in there in Burgundy. What do you call these cheddar biscuits? Bougère. 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 Triple cream, you say? It looks oh. like sexual cheese. Oh. Oh, this, this does smell like belly button. <laughs> Holy shit. It is these. Oh, dude, is. this is stinky. Like, even coming from a Taiwanese it's man not even that bad. who eats stinky tofu, this is stinky. This is like a bound foot preserved in belly button lid. Tell me that isn't great. Yeah, Honestly. That's funky. Compare it to tasting a wine. It's earthy, yeah. the texture is nice and creamy, it has very high acid. Yeah, it's the texture of like a perfect sweet egg custard, but savory. Yeah. See, this wine, it lacked a little of that Burgundian like funk, like that mushroom, but the cheese gave it to it, and the two of them work together perfectly. And that is the ultimate lesson to learn. Yeah. You know, maybe it doesn't have the best DNA because of the vintage or because of the vineyard or whatever, but, but put it with something else and see how the reaction happens.
nice to meet you. Definitely. Big fan of yours. Yeah. And Burgundy. You see the place of Burgundy and with the, the, the grapes we have and Principality, the two major, the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay, which are able maybe to understand that we are 80% of the minerality. And I think this connection we have, it's very important because when you develop this flavor, you touch your grand sympathique, you see, and like that, you are really in connection with what we are, because with the memory of our sense. And like that, you see, you are able to become more spiritual. If we make good wine, of course, everyone has this sensation. Yeah. And it's a very nice sensation. For that. Like Thoreau said, suck the marrow out of life, suck the marrow out of a bone, but wine is like sucking the marrow out of the ground. Absolutely. Dude, I just opened the door and I just put my head into like a bread asshole. It is the most delicious bread bungle. It's like distilled bread bungle flavors. It's so incredible. Like, don't you feel like you just opened up the butt of a bread and just put your head into it? Yeah. I went with the quiche because it's like, what, 9 a.m.? I need some protein. I can't just have empty carbs, right? Humans win again! <laughs> There's a lot of context in that shot. Yup. That's incredible. Looks good. <laughs> Bonjour. We are at Charcuterie Riyadh. This is Chef Eddie. We wanted to show you guys some of the charcuterie that we've been getting here. A lot of this is classic Burgundian charcuterie. We'll start with this. This is the pâté de pigeon. En coute. En coute. All right. Uh, all the all the food culture in Burgundy you can see is really really formed around wine. Okay. Excellent. The liver and the pate it has that earthy feel, but there's also a sweetness. There's a rosiness that goes really well with the hawthorn fruit notes in a Burgundian red wine, and it's not too heavy, so it doesn't overpower. The Burgundian wine cuts right through, which is perfect. This is a gnocchi tart. This dish here, it has chicken paste, it has bechamel cheese. This would be perfect with like a white wine from Merceau or maybe even Chablis farther north. This is so out of control. It's like a chicken pot pie on the bottom with bechamel fondue on top, all in a tart. Excellent, excellent. This is the most famous charcuterie dish in all of Burgundy, jambon persier. Ham and parsley with the gelatin on top. I like your jumbo parsier because you have a nice garlic note. You get a sharp garlicness from this and a mellow base note from the onion, and the parsley is perfect and fresh. I would highly recommend this dish with a, a dry Chardonnay. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. We're done. Yeah. Too, feel free to just drink. We'll hang. <laughs> oh, what's up, dude? Hey, bro. Good, good to see a friendly How you face. <laughs> Man, welcome. Yo, this is my first dinner I've made it to in Burgundy because we're taking like a bottle to the face before 12 and then another like bottle of the face between 12 and 3 I can't I can't hang with you guys I can't hang like if this was a smoking weed marathon I'd be I'd be all gold money. medalist yeah gold medal right here <laughs> Carlos yeah. the blue ribbon the wine you you've got to get used to this it's a headbanger the wine is important to burgundy but the food is also equally important yeah. and without one you can't have the other The 
food represented in America as French food is very much Burgundian. Oh, absolutely. Escargot, roasted Coco chicken, coca van, beef bourguignon. America takes what's easy to sell and then forgets everything else. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, but I'm it forgets everything else. I'm mad at it, though. I kind of like it. I love seeing the classics. I wanted to come to Burgundy and see it done at the highest level. Oh, so many. This is one of my favorite things to eat. These are things we've eaten a thousand times in sure. America, and you never know like how good it is. You add it in that you have the greatest wines of France from this region. It is the epicenter of food and wine. Mike, this is creme brulee in a glass. What are we, what are we drinking? This is, this is the real. This is white burgundy at its best. It's a single vineyard called Narvo. It's from Merceau. I'm so excited for this escargot. If you don't know what this is, you f***ed up somewhere in life. I've had it a million times, but I just like to see it done well. The fattiness of the escargot works with the fruit of the wine, yeah. but the salinity and the saltiness, they kind of merge together once that yeah. the richness fades. Certain dishes like this are around for hundreds of years because they work. And there's something universal about it, and it hits on a chord right. that like all of humanity can understand. Right. A Chinese guy can walk into a French restaurant, have escargot, and be like, I get it. Right. I get this. That's nature giving you her best. Here we go. This is a tough job I have, <laughs> eating all this stuff. Yeah, this is another Burgundian specialty, the Appalachian chicken. Burgundian Pinot Noir is the perfect wine with yeah. roasted chicken. It just matches up perfect. Right. Merci. Uh, dude. Very rarely am I speechless. <laughs> Could a brother get some mustard? I need some mustard. It's cold, it's raining on us, but we are at the Chateau de Merceau, the Pole de Merceau lunch, probably the biggest BYOB lunch you will ever see. And this is for all the wine growers in Merceau, which is white wine country. We're gonna check this out, we're gonna eat some food, we're gonna politic, we're gonna hobnob, we're gonna shake some hands and kiss some babies. Let's do this. Damn, this crib is bananas. Everybody here had to bring a bottle of wine for admission to this lunch. And everybody is bringing heat. You'll see people with big Jeroboams. You'll see people with wine from like the early 1900. It's wild. But it's also a big thing to come together for this region because they had a really tough year because of the hail. A lot of vines got damaged, but they're talking about staying strong, sticking together, and then pulling it up. All right, let's go. Cette folie est le rendez-vous incontournable des amateurs de nos grands vins, du Le Bourgogne, qui a une histoire, une culture et qui croit en son avenir. What do we got here? 92 Chablis Grand Cru Les Frus from Vincent Dovisa, who is like the greatest grower of, of white wine. This will be good with that first course. Thank you so much. Sure, Enjoy lunch, man. I'll be back for I'm more I'm around wine. you when you need All right. So, Chablis to me is one of the most interesting regions in terroir because it used to all be underwater. So a lot of oceanic life, whether it's crushed oyster shells, crushed clam, fish, squid, everything, it's all in the soil. Look at the color that dark color on a 22-year-old wine. 
This is hands down the best Chablis I ever had. Thank you. So the first course here is foie gras. They got a little gelée here and chutney. The foie gras pairing with this 92 Dolby Sassabli is perfect because the creaminess in the foie gras complements this wine. This wine stands up to creaminess and fat very well. It's steely, it has the seaweed and crust oyster shell minerality, it's perfect. Dish called Saint Pierre. Oh, okay, it's a Saint Pierre fish. Why is it called Saint Pierre? I don't know. <laughs> we got a Dominique Lafont from Merceau, 2008, right here. Usually the food brings out the wine, but this this wine is actually bringing out the food. The food's a little stronger flavor than the wine. the quality and the vintages that you're tasting. That's this is a lifetime of wine. I drink yeah. a lot of burgundy, so I stay very young. Yeah. That's, that's the secret. Yeah, you have the Asian dolphin skin. Exactly. <laughs> it's so nice to meet very you. It's nice a pleasure. That is fire. We got heat. Nice almondy note. Well, absolutely, that absolutely. It almost tastes like champagne. And Jock, you made this wine, yeah? You made this. Hey, yeah, cheers to the chef. <laughs> cheers to the chef. That 96 Jock Port is on fire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's good, right? Oh, I'm not dude. an idiot. No, 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 dude. It's That's Morgue. That's too. the greatest white yeah. wine in Burgundy. What other heat we gonna see, fam? I want scud missiles. <laughs> Yo. So everybody else poured their whites, and whites are cool. Whites, whites, are, whites are cool. Whites are cool. But yo, Michael, just open up this heat, son. Let's go. Claude de la Rose, good. This is Linier, Hubert Linier, one of our favorite producers. His best vineyard. Yo. Wow. Ooh. That's what it's about, brother. Funky like an old batch of collard greens. Oh, I don't know if that's that heat. I don't know if that's that heat. <laughs> He got that backyard boogie. <laughs> Yo, why would you come and have step? Like, why would you have step? You know no, what you have? that's what I don't understand. This is the best BYO in the world. Yeah. You know, if you're going to bring wine anywhere, you got to come correct. You want to pour some whack wine, I'll go out in front of Momofuku. <laughs> but here? Yeah. At the Pole? We're looking for Middle East tea. Yeah. Yeah. That's yes. What we want. Big sexy right here. Claude de la Rose, 90. Nice. Merci. Crisp and stony, not as good as Jacques 92. Dolby Sad! Bonsoir! 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 <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> the thing I like about wine is that, you know, I feel like in life, when you don't understand something, you hang on the poles. But when you really, truly start to understand something, you're able to build your own value system and moral compass. I already had my value system, and yeah. wine was there to verify it. I don't believe what people tell me. I, I've never been that person, and I've always pursued more. I've always wanted to search further to find what I feel is important to me and wine is that thing where i don't give a shit what anybody says yeah. you know i'll listen but i don't believe i'm searching my own path i'm just very happy that this place in the world burgundy exists because it makes my life more interesting welcome do most of the work, every vintage needs a guardian. Ben LaRue is one of Burgundy's great young winemakers, protecting the vine 
creating the next generation of fine wines. How are you? Very good. Eddie Wong, nice to yeah, meet you. Yeah, yeah. I heard all about you. I heard you are the best young winemaker in, in all of Burgundy. That is what people tell me. Really? Yes. They're all lying. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was reading online, you decided at 13 to go to wine school, but you know, most people haven't even tasted wine at 13 yet. How did you know? Uh, because I've started uh, at five. So oh, wine. tasting, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot about your wine. What is it that makes you special as a winemaker for you personally? No, there's, a, there's nothing special. Nothing? No, 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 no. The only thing different is to stay simple, you know, simple on the, the, the way you're working. So I studied at a young, young age, but when I was uh, early, early 20s and uh, starting at Pont Armand, I was asking, I think, myself too much question. Yeah. And wanting to do too many things. Uh, basically, the work I'm doing now is very simple. What is the difference in relationship between like the winemaker and the grape? What I'm trying to do is just to let the vineyard express itself. Mm -hmm. Because here you're dealing with one of the top vineyards, so yeah. it's got enough character. It will be very stupid to work to work against the land, against the terroir. You don't need to be a good winemaker to, to make Genevrière if you've got a piece of land like this. Yeah. How was the crop this year? It was, uh, in terms of quality, amazing. And on top of that, it's, uh, it's my first vintage, so it's always, you know, uh, a great thing, but we made only one and a half barrel. Yeah. Oh, that's so it. So production will be right, 450 bottle. Sometimes, you know, you you're working hard and, uh, and the result is not there. Yeah. You have to accept that you are not in control of everything. Uh, nature is uh, more powerful than us. From what I'm noticing, tell me if I'm wrong. The producer to me in Burgundy seems like a gatekeeper, someone who protects the land and protects the vine, not necessarily adding to it or doing anything, but just caretaking and, yeah. and protecting it. Yeah, it's what we are. Yeah. I was needing to be outside. I was yeah. needing to, to create things and create things from something that nature is giving. Yeah, I don't feel I'm working. Yeah. That's, that's the best thing. When you love it, it's not yeah. work. For me, I'm the first generation, so everything I'm, I'm building, I'm already teaching my kids. Hopefully, uh, I'll find a way to, to pass it on to my children. And we're trying to train as many, uh, as many young, young people uh, as we can. Being in this cellar and seeing these wines from 1858 to 2014, you start to realize that you're looking at something intangible, like time, manifest itself in wine. And it's captured bottle by bottle by bottle. And this is a story that the earth gave this winemaker in 750 milliliters. And if he does it right and protects the story and transmits the story into the bottle, he can leave it behind for somebody else. And that's why wine is special to me, but specifically Burgundy and its winemakers, because the great ones understand not to inject themselves, not to put themselves into the bottle, but to be protectors. And my dad taught me as a kid, be a giver, not a taker. Burgundians take it one step further. They're protectors. They protect so that the earth can keep giving, and they can as well.